It is a truth universally acknowledged that a reader in possession of a good book must be in want of another. If that sounds like you, come along with me as I explore my bookshelves, read you stories, talk to authors, and chat about all the books as we search for our next great read. Grab your favorite book, a cup of tea, and settle in for the greatest adventures ever imagined. Welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Bookshelf Odyssey Podcast. My name is Art, and I'm the host and narrator of the show. Today we won't have a story, but we are talking about Charlotte Bronte and Jane Eyre. I have a special guest on the show with me. Her name is Rita Martinez. She is a poet and a few years ago published a book inspired by Jane Eyre called The Jane and Bertha in Me. I first read Jane Eyre a few years back. My history with Jane Eyre goes back a little farther than that. Uh, I can remember being, I think as a teenager, somebody told me about the book and ruined the twist about uh, Rochester and uh, and again, spoilers here, but uh, about uh, Rochester and his secret uh, that he was hiding in the attic. I don't know. I don't really think it fazed me too much. And then I believe I had seen a college play uh, production. It was really well done. Before or after, I think I had seen uh, uh, the movie version of it as well. When it finally came time to read Jane Eyre, my first thought was, well, I've seen the movie. I've seen the play. Do I really need to read this? But I went and got a copy from the library and sat down and read it. And sure enough, I'm sure glad I did because it is a fantastic, fantastic story. Now, I've talked a little bit about the Brontes on the podcast as well as on my YouTube channel. And I got into a, a kind of a fun discussion with a, a viewer over on YouTube uh, about uh, Anne Bronte versus Charlotte Bronte and what books we like better. Like I said, uh, Anne Bronte is my favorite of the Brontes, but when I say favorite, it's not like I hate the other two. They're, they're all three just very talented, but I think I enjoy, have enjoyed Anne Bronte's two books the most of all of their work. And my problem with Jane Eyre is not with Jane Eyre. She's a fabulous, fabulous character. Um, she's, she's strong. She's sticks to her principles. Uh, we're going to talk about that with uh, Rita. And Rita actually helped me understand that a little bit better too, uh, about just how well or, or how much um, Jane sticks to her principles, even in the face of the heartbreak she faces in the book. My problem with Jane Eyre is Rochester. I don't like him. I'm not sure we're supposed to like him. I don't know. He's He's very flawed. And... I don't think he deserves to be with, and again, spoilers here, but I don't think he deserves to be with Jane in the end. I don't know. Maybe you disagree. And, and I'm open to discussing that. You know, this is not a hill I'm going to die on. I'm still trying to come to terms with that, but he just seems very manipulative and just awful, to be honest, and sarcastic, but not in a fun way, you know? He just seems mean, like he'd, he'd be more suited to uh, Wuthering Heights than to Jane Eyre. But I don't know. That's my impressions. In full disclosure, I have not read the book in quite a few years. So some of my details might be a little hazy. I definitely want to do a reread of that again soon. Uh, so those are my thoughts on Jane Eyre. Just a few thoughts there on the Brontes. Bottom line, I think they're all three just genius writers. Maybe we need to stop saying one's better than the other and, and just, I don't know. There's enough room in my, on my bookshelf for all three and to love them all equally. Well, I'm going to be quiet for now and turn it over to the interview and I'll come back at the end just to, to wrap up and say goodbye. Uh, but I hope you enjoy my interview with Rita Martinez. Welcome uh, to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. Uh, my, again, my name is Art, and uh, I'm here with Rita Maria Martinez. She is a poet and a Jane Eyre fan, so much so that she was inspired to write uh, a book about it in poetry, 
the Jane and Bertha and Me is a uh, poem collection inspired by the book Jane Eyre. Uh, and so I'm happy to have Rita joining us today. Uh, welcome, Rita, to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. Hi, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and with Art on your podcast today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, I, I had shared with you, and, and some folks might recognize you from uh, a, a past uh, Bonnet, Bonnets at Dawn episode. Uh, that's a podcast I enjoy, uh, and uh, and you might have heard you or, or seen you around in some of the, the forums and different places like that. So uh, it's always nice to put a face to uh, to the uh, voice behind the keyboard, as it were. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing, like what has been happening with uh, you know all these Zoom uh, readings and just different online types of readings where like you're interacting with people like around the world mm -hmm. uh, even just a year ago when they had the 2020 Bronte virtual conference that was a pretty neat thing yeah I I think I was hoping to watch some of that I can't remember if I actually <laughs> was able to make it or not but uh, I remember th they've been having there have been several conferences like that there was one for a uh, uh, Dickens world I think uh, is what it was called. They had a conference online too, and I caught some of those videos. But well, today later, uh, later today they're actually mm -hmm. having a a Zoom session uh, for the author for Gilbert and Gubar, the authors of the Mad Woman in the Attic. Mm. Uh, you know that famous book of literary criticism, mm -hmm. and that's going to be today. So that'll be a treat. They have a new book that is out. Uh, yeah, I, I'm excited. Later this week, uh, the the uh, Gaskell House is doing a virtual tour of of Elizabeth Gaskell's house on Zoom. Oh, and, great! And I was it, I think it costs just a couple of bucks, and you get to log in and go along with them on the virtual tour uh, live. Oh, yeah, so uh, a lot of opportunities have come up uh, in this past year and a half. And unfortunately, <laughs> I guess we'd say partly unfortunately. Uh, because of all that we've had to go through, but um, there's always a silver lining that, um, well, I wanted to invite uh, Rita on today. You kind of uh, gave me a, a shout out on, on the Facebook of Bonnet at Dawn and uh, wanted to know if I was going to be talking about uh, Jane Eyre at some point and uh, would love to, to join in with us. Uh, and I definitely had plans and I still have plans to probably do something deeper in the future uh, because I just love, I love that book. Personally, I first read it a couple of years ago. Boy, it's probably a little bit longer than a couple now, but I was part of a, a online book group and that was the first book they decided to, to read. And I th I'm like, this, oh, that sounds great. I, I've, I saw the movie, I, I've, se I've seen a play, but I had, hadn't actually read it. So to sit down and read it, it was, oh, it was really good. Uh, so what's, what's your history with Jane Eyre and, and Charlotte Bronte, because, I mean, it sounds like it's had a quite a tremendous impact on your life. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was first assigned to read Jane Eyre as a junior in high school. It was a, a British lit honors course, and the teacher who taught it was very enthusiastic. She, mm -hmm. I remember her talking about that she reread the novel over the summer and she just had like a, a lot of energy. She was a very good, uh, very good teacher. So that was the first time that I read Jane Eyre. Uh, as a teenager, I remember kind of like reading the first half and thinking, oh my gosh, there's so much suffering in this book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because of course, like whenever injustices were committed against Jane when she's a child, it's like you would get, I would get riled up along with her, like, oh, I can't believe they did that to her. <laughs> or they put her on the stool, just probably not pass out. So, like, it was like you get this sort of righteous indignation. But then, you know, there's other moments toward the beginning of the book where you're like, yeah, like when Jane tells off uh, Mrs. Reed, you know, because Jane as a, as a child, she has kind of a strong character, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I remember that reading the first half, I thought, whoa, there's a lot of suffering here. But then something happened, like when she got to, for me, when she got to Thornfield, I could not put the second half of the book down at all. 
Mm-hmm. So I remember it, reading it in the Florida room of my parents' house, and you know it was always there in the outer pocket of my East Pack for a while. But I, I guess I also like, you know, as a kid, I always liked those old horror movies like with Bela Lugosi and all of those uh, type of actors. So yeah. not that this is a horror book, but it has that element of the gothic since it's a gothic romance. And my teacher was very smart. The best thing that she did was she told us, do not read the introduction. Mm-hmm. Okay, don't read the introduction. Read the book and read the introduction at the end because there are secrets that may be revealed that you will find out. So I had no clue. You know, I was just like a 16 or 17 year old who like, I, I didn't know anything about any of the other characters in there really. I didn't really know much about it. Yeah. So, it, it, but it, yeah, it was the type of thing that when I finished reading the book, I felt somehow, I didn't know how, but I felt somehow like, oh, my life w- had changed or was going to shift. And then gradually, yeah. years, you know, I did what everybody I think has done that whenever there's been a new uh, adaptation, you flock to the movie theater mm-hmm. to watch it. So I remember being out of high school. And I remember like the Zeffirelli adaptation, you know, being out and watching it. I also remember at some point I was like, I had a final the next day. And this was as as an undergraduate, was it? I don't remember. Either as an undergraduate or a graduate student, I had a final the next day. And on TV, they were playing the Orson Welles adaptation of Jane Eyre. And I remember (laughs) like blowing off the final until like I finished watching that because I Uh had never seen that like on you know this is you know I guess I'm giving my age before all this era of streaming (laughs) Uh and and all that so uh so I remember that happening and then at some point in graduate as an undergraduate I took a creative writing course where I wrote a poem inspired by Jane Eyre Mm -hmm. and then as a poet whenever you have a successful poem Sometimes you want to write what's called a companion poem, a poem that relates in some way to the first one. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That idea of if you have a success, you want to try to recreate it. Right. <laughs> try to try to capture lightning in a bottle twice or something. <laughs> and it just seemed like a universe I was comfortable with. Yeah, uh, I, I love what you said, too, uh, that when you read it, for the first time, you knew that something would be different about you. Uh, I I can think of a handful of books now that I've had that experience that this book changed me in some way. And I don't know what yet, but something's different. If it's either my perspective on life or uh, my view of myself or view of life or whatever, it, it gets changed. And uh, that, that, that's, um, Sometimes I, I tell that to people and they look at me like I'm weird, but I, I'm glad to find someone who's experienced that <laughs> that same thing. Yeah. Rereading it throughout my life at, during different ages or stages of my life, I've mm-hmm. related to different characters. I don't know if that's happened to you. Like when I first read it, I related the most to Jane. Mm-hmm. Uh, at some other moments that were difficult times in my life, I related to Bertha, you know. So, you know, it's just things that I never thought, you know, other characters that I would like relate to as I got older. Yeah, I I can see that. Uh, I've reread a lot of uh, Dickens work. He's my probably my favorite um, classic author, Uh, but I have quite a few fighting for that second place. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it's I read some of his books when I'm younger, but now as I'm older, you know, those different characters you connect with or even parts of the story that you hadn't even remembered or maybe weren't that emphasized when you first read it. You know, thanks to your life experiences as you get older, so different parts of those stories become more relevant. Uh, and I think that's what really makes a book a classic is that it can withstand that rereading process and and not just that critical examination, but uh, you know, I've read this book two or three or four times and I still enjoy it. And each time it's different. Uh, but but overall, it still inspires me. It still 
um, makes me cry. It still makes me laugh, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I, those, those are the books that I think will really last those that can hold up to that kind of uh, rereading. Yeah. I've been wanting to read David Copperfield. I've never read that one. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's one that's of his. Another, another orphan, right? Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, David Copperfield, he's, uh, an orphan. Um, he goes through all kinds of adventures, you know, as Dickens characters tend to do. Uh, that that story is more autobiographical of Dickens than some of his other work uh, is. So you, you get a little bit of a sense of who Dickens is as a person in that. Um, I, I don't I haven't read a lot of biography of the Brontes, so I don't know fully like how much of that would be in their work or not. Well, it is titled Jane Eyre, an autobiography, so definitely there are autobiographical elements in it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, Jane was a governess, and, you know, at some point, uh, at some point, you know, Charlotte, you know, was a governess, and, and, uh, and the youngest sister, Anne, as well. So, um, she did go. Uh, Charlotte did attend uh, a school away from home when she was little, but for a very brief time, because I think the elder sister, uh, Mariah, died at the school. Um, so I think Lowood is based after, is based upon that school. Uh, I think, I if I'm correct, it was Charlotte and Emily that were very young girls, and then when the older sister's health started declining, Patrick was very concerned, and he pulled them out of that school right away. So there's different elements. We also have a, a, a character in the book who is a clergyman, and uh, we know that Charlotte Bronte, just because her father was a minister or a reverend, right, that she mm -hmm. interacted at certain points with a uh, clergy and she did marry a clergyman as well arthur nichols mm -hmm. so she had time to um observe people who uh, of the cloth you know maybe some she liked maybe others she didn't like so much and i think that comes through in this book but more so in other books like in shirley and in some of her other works D didn't their father outlive all of, all of his kids is that right yeah, yeah 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 and people sometimes are a little critical of arthur nichols because mm -hmm. of a couple of things he did but from what i've read he took care of patrick after mm -hmm. everybody you know was uh was gone he as a son-in-law took care mm -hmm. of patrick at least i read that in in one of the bios can't remember which and I thought, wow, that's a big deal, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's kind of a big deal because initially Patrick was against the wedding. In right. Charlotte Bronte's letters, she's really funny. She talks about that she thinks like that her dad has a blood vessel that's going to burst. <laughs> <laughs> it was like this big whole thing because like he professes that he's in love to her, kind of almost out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. and then like a bit of a drama for a while where poor Arthur has to be around the Reverend Patrick Bronte. But it wasn't easy for him in the beginning because uh, Mr. the Reverend Bronte for a while wanted nothing to do with him. He was hating his guts because he thought that the guy wasn't good enough for his daughter. Yeah. For whatever reason. So that guy had it kind of rough in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and despite, you know, that I thought that that said something about his character, that he took care of Patrick Bronte when the rest of the family was already um, deceased. Right. But yes, Patrick Bronte outlived everybody. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, as a father of a daughter, I can understand that super critical, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Who, who's going to marry my daughter? He better be the, the best of the best, you know, but yes. uh, I don't have to worry about that with my daughter for a few years yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Prepare yourself. laughs> right. Well, yeah, she's, uh, she's 12 going on 16. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Oh, you know, speaking of biographies, it, 
Do you have a favorite Bronte biography or, or one that would you would recommend to people? A lot of people swear by the Barker's one, Juliet Barker's bi mm -hmm. biography. Uh, I know a couple of years ago I read, oh God, I'm so bad with names, Claire. Oh, yeah. Her first uh, name is Claire, I want to say. Is it uh, Claire Tomlin? Probably. I read, it, it was like one that came out just a couple of years ago. Um, but I read a bunch of different books. I have a book that is about the art of the Brontes. Uh, mm -hmm. I've read different books that are like, well, what happens after Jane Eyre, right? Mm -hmm. um, just things, things like that. So, you know, yeah. but what I've really enjoyed reading a lot mm -hmm. are the letters. Yeah, I haven't read those. I, I, I was just reading something today. Uh, that said, those are really good. Like, yes, really yes. should seek them out. Yeah. I have three volumes of Margaret Smith's letters, and like, they're not that easy to get in hard copy format. Mm -hmm. One I got, it was a former, it was a used library book from from a library in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a good deal on that one because they're kind of pricey. They're an investment, but they are so worth it. Every letter contains a universe of footnotes. Sometimes the footnotes are just as interesting as the actual as the actual uh, letters. And you find little tidbits now and then, like what I told you about Charlotte writing, I, it was probably to Ellen Nussie, but she was writing, oh, I just really thought the father's forehead, it looked like whipcord, da 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 da. There's interesting things. And so, you, you know, there's moments where you read the letters and you laugh because you think yeah. that's kind of funny. Yeah. Then there's also moments, obviously, of great sadness, mm -hmm. you know, because, there, you know, there, there was a lot of death involved in their lives. And so, and Charlotte writes about all those things. So you read about how Charlotte feels, you know, when Branwell is in his decline. Mm -hmm. and how she feels when that happens with uh with the other sisters so it's a mix of things but it's it's they're very thorough i think now they also exist in digital in a digital version and mm -hmm. i initially read some letters that i think were also a book of letters compiled by julia barker also if i'm not mistaken okay however um margaret smith has just really been those the, those are great. I mean, they take a long time to read, but they're so worth it. I think it's a type of thing that a Bronte fan can go to those letters, um, go back to them time and time again. Almost as if, like, let's say if something difficult is happening in one's own life, it's sort of, I don't want to say because we feel bad for the grief that the Brontes went through at times, mm -hmm. but it's almost like, Oh, they were real. They were real people. They were real yeah. people who had real highs and, and real lows. You know, obviously there were a lot of things back then that I would say were tougher, like yeah. life expectancy and <laughs> right. you know right. what happens. You know, uh, women giving birth and things like that that were more health challenging than now. I, I think it's good to remember, you know, that they were people. You know, flaws and all. Uh, mm -hmm. That's when I I started reading a lot of biographies and things of, of Dickens and, you know, there's, a, there's a complicated guy. <laughs> he, he had some really great moments and then he had some pretty, pretty awful moments. And well, I don't know if it's yeah. true, but I, I really don't know if it's true, but I heard somebody once say that Helen Keller was a racist. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I haven't heard that, but yeah. Sometimes you read stuff and, you know, you find out, I think with real like hardcore Bronte fans, be, because you love the work so much, you just want to know more. So you start devouring other books, whether it's biographies or letters or prequels or whatever it is, or spinoff books, you start devouring those because you kind of just can't get enough. In that, I'm a little different. Now, when it comes to like movie actors, I'm a little different with that. Mm -hmm. uh, like if somebody posts online, like if it's a movie actor that I like from, you know, the golden age of cinema or something, mm -hmm. and somebody posts something negative about the person, I think I'd rather not know. I just want to see the person in that role, in that movie that I like where they play the good guy. Right. I don't know. So I guess, you know, we have, I have my own contradictions. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, you know, they say, they always say never meet your hero. So <laughs> you'll be disappointed. <laughs> I've had some good experiences with that, but uh, yeah. it's probably good advice. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah. If you go in knowing that, uh, hey, this person's going to be flawed, just like we all are in some way, you know, uh, and there's a lot you can say too to understand the time that they didn't know as much about people like we do today and uh, what's right and what's not and stuff like that. It's, I mean, I don't want to, um, you know, excuse things like racism and all that, but uh, you got to understand it a little bit too, I think. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, we know that Charlotte Bronte had very anti Catholic uh, sentiments. Mm-hmm race Catholic, but I'm not going to let that get in the way of me enjoying the works. Right. You know, because also you have to put yourself in the mindset of the era in which she lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and when, when I, I I read a lot of, you know, 19th century literature. So sometimes you, you come across points of view or different things where you're like, Oh, that's, that's really awful. (laughs) You know, that's, that makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know, I, I'm still working through some of that, but it's it's like there are some where I can understand maybe it's just the character's point of view versus it's the author's point of view. And he's trying to say, you know, like this, there's that line where it's, if it's too uncomfortable for me, it, it's like, all right, I'm just, I'm not going to read that anymore. <laughs> that kind of happens to me with people are not going to hate me with Weathering Heights because I think mm-hmm. he is a total scumbag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a love story. It's a cautionary tale. Mm, yeah. So I uh, also signed that book, and I read that one after Jane Eyre. Mm. I thought, Whoa, that's a really different type of book. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up w- Wuthering Heights because I, I read it, like I think a lot of people do, thinking that this is some great tragic love story. And well, uh, there is tragedy. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not. <laughs> I was I was thinking maybe more Romeo and Juliet versus uh, oh, I see. Yeah. the I, I don't know. Like I, I finished that and I thought, I think I just read a book about two people being awful to each other. And I don't understand what happened. Yeah, there's a lot of characters that are, you know, abused in that book. And yeah, people wonder. Emily didn't step outside of the house much. People wonder, like, how did she come up with that? But obviously she was a genius. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I, I've read Emily's poetry, and of the three, I have enjoyed her poetry the best. Mm-hmm. I like a lot in Emily's poetry, especially when she, all the clever ways in which she personifies nature in her mm-hmm. poems. Sometimes they're kind of playful and I think very creative. So I like that very much about her poetry. And a, a couple of years ago, I did reread Weathering Heights again to give it a second shot. Um, but I read it more in the mindset of, let me just read it to enjoy the, the beautiful descriptions of the landscape and, uh, and uh, you know, the sights and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Because the book's very strong in that as well. It's it's but by no means it's a it's definitely not a not a boring book. I know it's a favorite among many people. Um, a couple of years back, remember when those Twilight movies and those Twilight books were very yeah. popular, like mm-hmm. with youth, mm-hmm. teenagers. Um, supposedly, in one of those books, Bella's favorite book is uh, Weathering Heights, and mm-hmm. uh, teenagers started reading Weathering Heights in drove because they wanted to read. Bella's favorite book. So, I mean, that tells you about sort of the timelessness of the story. It's not my favorite, and but, you know, that we all have our own tastes and everything. I, I'm, I'm going to be rereading Wuthering Heights again in October. Um, there's a, a reading challenge with a group I follow, and they're going to, uh, a couple of the uh, ladies who run it, they're going to do a a read, uh, a read along with that and have zoom meetings and discuss it. And, uh, I, and, you know, they're telling people don't make the mistake and read it, you know, the way I first did and approach oh. it from, from this angle. Okay. Uh, it, it, um, you know, the, uh, I forget how they describe it now, but it's, um, yeah, but it's not like a Jane Austen type love story, right. you know? Exactly. And, uh, exactly. 
So I'm, I'm looking forward to rereading it. But uh, like you said, the one thing I did rejo- uh, enjoy was those descriptions uh, and the way she could write a sentence. Uh, is a, a, the, the one line that's pretty f- famous, something like, whatever stuff souls are made of, yours and mine are the same, if I got the quote right. Um, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, and she, yeah. Well, she was a very interesting person. Like you read a lot of descriptions about what Emily did and said in Charlotte's letters, and she was like a really interesting person. Mm. I think if she was alive nowadays, she would probably have all her writing set like with passwords and firewalls and all these things because she was very private about her writing. So nowadays, I just think she would have passwords on everything and use technology to like protect her writing. Yeah. I I almost hate to ask this question, but uh, I'll ask it this way. Do you have a favorite of the Bronte sisters or do you want that question just to go away? (laughs) Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind. My favorite Bronte sister is Charlotte. I know that there's a lot of, there are some Bronte fans that she's their least favorite, Mm -hmm. you know, some fans. Agnes is, is um, not Agnes, Anne. Anne is their, is their favorite. Um, I found Charlotte to be inter- uh, to have an interesting life. Uh, in the letters, it's very interesting. You get to read reviews people wrote of Jane Eyre, and you get to read what were Charlotte Bronte's, uh, how did she respond to that? How, how did she respond when uh, was it Elizabeth Rigby said that uh, the author of Jane Eyre must be someone who has long forfeited the society of her sex, right? Mm-hmm. That was kind of a brutal statement there. Yeah. So y- you see the relationship between herself and her publisher where they write letters back and forth. Uh, you read about when they went to, to meet the publisher to say, hey, we are three different people. We're not all the same people, right? Mm-hmm. You just like learn a lot of things about her life that I find interesting. So she is my favorite. But in real life, though, I think the most interesting one for me probably would be Emily. She does like all these things, like a, a dog bites her and she goes into the kitchen and she cauterizes the the wound, right? With yeah. like whatever it that she had in the kitchen. I mean, really. Yeah, she's just an interesting character herself. Yeah, didn't um, one of them write that scene in a book, or was I? Am I thinking of some something else? I think somebody uh, said something that doesn't Heathcliff, as a kid, kind of kill or torture some dogs or something. Yeah, maybe maybe that was it. But, but yeah. people mention this sometimes when they talk about uh, Emily's character. I mean, she was. And this is a funny dated description, but she was a tough broad. <laughs> yeah. Because even when she was kind of close to death, she would dress herself. She didn't want anybody to dress her. She would take her time if it took her half an hour to get dressed or however long. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. She did it herself and seemed like to the very last, she was very, she had a very strong will of what she wanted and what she didn't want. Mm. But she just seems like interesting, like it would have been interesting to just sit there and listen to her talk or just watch her about like with someone else, you might watch them go about their regular household chores or whatnot. But I bet with Emily, it would have been even that, that would have been a lot more interesting is the idea that I get. Yeah. So my favorite is Charlotte, but in terms of like who do, but I also find Emily super interesting. You know, I think they all had, you know, their positives and their negatives. And obviously the youngest sister, she seems to, you know, um, I know some people might not like, but she seems, she's always described as being very sweet and this and that. Um, she went through a lot of turmoil when Branwell had that affair. Mm-hmm. Uh, with his employer and in Charlotte's letters you learn some of that you know and in other things but you know I, I mean they were all interesting yeah. to me mm-hmm. they were all interesting really yeah yeah uh, I I probably probably like uh, Anne Bronte the best and I 
and I'm not sure if it's, uh, well, I, I read a biography sort of, of her called take courage. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, have you, are you, have you read that one? I or, read that one. Okay. I heard about it. Yeah. I can't remember what, uh, who, who wrote it now, <laughs> but, uh, so that one focuses on Anne Bronte and, and maybe, it, but it, the way the author, she wrote it is it's part memoir of her own life mixed in with her research into the, to the Brontes, including Anne and how she had this connection with Anne. And, um, it's, it's one of those biographies, you know, I, I was crying at the end of, cause it was just so oh, beautiful wow. and, yeah. and, and heartbreaking, you know, Anne's life cut short and, uh, all that she had to go through. But I, I so I, I probably point to that biography as being the one that makes, makes me more, uh, inclined to like Anne over the others. But, um, I say that as if there is one that was better. I mean, all three were just genius yeah. writers yeah. and, yeah. So whenever I get asked that question, I, I usually will say something like, well, why can't we like all three? You know, <laughs> all three are so good uh, with what they, they wrote. You know, I, I like some of their stories better than others. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I think they all have uh, just remark or had remarkable talent and uh, what they're able to accomplish during a time when, uh, well, when women, you know, didn't have much of a voice, couldn't work and anything they they owned was their husbands and all all that stuff that went on you know um, I, I think it's it's amazing what they were able to accomplish I think the father gave them a lot of free reign in terms of what they could read because it, it just seems like they could read whatever was in the house from his library mm-hmm. so it, it, it seems like he like was just was a bit open-minded and he you know because they were well read we know that they were well read um, mm-hmm. in the Bible, but in many other books as well. And they would read, uh, you know, magazines and different things. So periodicals of the time. I guess uh, coming back to Jane Eyre for a moment, and uh, just spoiler alert, if you haven't read any of this yet, but <laughs> if you haven't read Jane Eyre, go, go read it first of all. But I, I did want to talk about the ending a little bit. Do you think, I don't know, my... And I need to reread Jane Eyre, but I wasn't sure I really liked Rochester at all. And I'm not sure I was happy that they end up together at the end, but maybe I'm missing something there, or maybe that's your point of view too, or what are your thoughts on that? He's a mixed bag, but I prefer him to Heathcliff, but he's, he's a mixed Mm -hmm. bag. I think that sometimes people forget. I'm not defending what he did, Mm -hmm. but I think that sometimes people forget that he did pay for bad things that he did, uh, you know, by what happens to him at the end of the novel physically. Mm -hmm. People forget that, right? Because turn it off if you haven't read it, people. But he loses a hand, and that's a big deal. Imagine yourself, like, losing a hand and having to go through surgery back then. Oh, yeah. Plus, after everything that happened, um, and he lost sight partially he lost sight in one eye and then he he's disfigured partially so he didn't get away with things scot free i would say um i think that he's a mixed bag you know at the time from what i've read institutions uh uh for the mentally ill um you didn't know how your relatives were going to be treated they Mm -hmm. might be like mistreated they might be like you know, there might be very poor hygiene and uh, things like that. I think a lot of the reforms in institutions like that hadn't been um, carried out yet. So, you know, I always think, though, well, in that room upstairs where Bertha is like, at least in movies, it's always just it's always very plain. There's like practically nothing in the room. Mm-hmm. And you assume it's because they don't want her to hurt herself or to hurt Grace, right? Mm -hmm. But I always think, oh, they should have made her room a little nicer. Like, you know, maybe they could have, I know it's hard, like now, like parents kitty proof everything, right? But I always feel like they could have, if she's gonna be all that time in her room, I've always felt like, couldn't they make her room kind of like nicer? Like, you know, but I mean, this is focusing on how the way that she's depicted in movies. Mm -hmm. So, but, 
even then, probably living there was probably better than living in an institution. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, I don't approve of being a bigamist uh, and and not telling the truth to Jane Eyre. Just like I don't approve in 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 certain versions of comics when Clark Kent uh, proposes to Lois Lane and he fails to tell her that he's Superman. Right. It's like, oh, you proposed? That's like a big deal that you didn't tell me that you were Superman. So of course, like I don't, I don't approve. I don't approve of uh, of that. I think at times he does uh, try to emotionally or psychically manipulate people. Like as much as I hate her guts, what he did to Blanche Ingram was wrong. Mm-hmm. Because he kind of like led her on and was just using her basically to make Jane jealous. Right. So even though I don't like Blanche Ingram, I think that, oh, he really shouldn't have, he really shouldn't have uh, done that. And that whole thing where, where, you know, where uh, he dresses up uh, to fool Jane. Yeah. It's kind of like, wow, that's really psychologically uh, manipulative but the, the the great thing about the novel is Jane doesn't allow herself to be manipulated easily by by anyone because she's just like a, a strong character and she's very intelligent and in some ways independent despite the time in which she in which she lived but yeah I don't approve of it but then here's the problem I read the book initially when I was 16 Mm-hmm. And when I was 16, obviously my brain was very different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how it is now. So like, I I don't know. As a teenager, I found those scenes where Jane and Rochester would talk, like, in his study or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, at night, I just thought, oh my god, this is so damn sexy. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, <laughs> like there was like all this sexual tension between them and because he was kind of i know he was like often in a bad temper and he could sometimes just be rude to her and rude to fairfax and rude to adele but he had i don't know if it's the bad guy thing like a lot you know i don't know if it was that but he just seemed kind of mysterious and interesting and then there's the whole thing all the drama when they first meet and um so it's kind of i put that more into perspective now as an Mm -hmm. adult but yeah do i still enjoy those scenes and everything yes i do i have to say so as a teenager i was kind of besotted by rochester i'm afraid to say yeah (laughs) (laughs) so I i can criticize people who who uh maybe defend Heathcliff somewhat, but here I am guilty as a teenager and somewhat in adulthood of being a bit besotted by Rochester. So I just say to people, keep in mind the times, the times, and and I guess ultimately you have to form your form your own opinion. But let's not forget that he does suffer. He does suffer a lot. Yeah. He's a changed man at the end. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I feel like my impression there is that he does change at the end, that it's it's uh, broken him. It's, um, you know, it, it's changed him. Maybe he's he's learned right. his lesson and he's yeah. not the same man he was. I never get that from Heathcliff. Heathcliff right. is never sorry. In my opinion, he's not sorry about anything he's ever done. Right. Right. And if he is, if he is, he won't admit it to anyone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and wasn't um, that kind of dark and brooding character it was kind of a popular figure back in the yeah. day too, wasn't it? An ironic sort yeah. of yeah, figure. Yeah. Yeah. Because I can think like even going farther back to, you know, Mr. Darcy has kind of that, that oh, dark, yeah. dark yeah. mysterious air about him, you know, and, and he's really rude. He's yeah. really at that party where he kind of like this is uh, Elizabeth mm-hmm. and she kind of can't stand him for like most of the book yeah right yeah if it were me I'd be all into Bingley B- Bingley okay <laughs> I think Bingley is a good sport like if you were Bingley's girlfriend or if you were on a date with Bingley like if you put his character into modern times now mm-hmm. I think he'd 
be up for anything. He he's a good sport. He'd be like, "All right, let's do that." <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh boy, that's that sounds like a whole other podcast episode yeah. <laughs> right there. Yeah. Talk, talking about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm pro Bingley. Okay, good. Yeah. I also like a lot of in northern north north anger abbey mm -hmm. by austin i i i like henry tilney okay yeah yeah he's kind yeah. of fun he's kind of fun and he makes jokes and stuff i i like him right now that one is that's the one that kind of makes fun of the gothic stories yeah okay and um, it's my favorite austin book oh is it okay yeah I, I don't hear that a lot that's i know but it is my favorite austin book yeah yeah, that's uh, I. I've read that one, and um, I think it's one. It's one of those that I think I'll enjoy more as I reread it. There's a, an adaptation that is great. It's not a recent one, honestly. I don't remember when it, when it was. It may have been in the '90s, but where, whenever Charlotte reads a book, you see her imagine. Not Charlotte. Is it what's it? Caroline. Caroline. Yeah. Whenever Caroline reads a book. Mm -hmm. the scenes become the action you're in the book mm. and she's a character in the book when she has like these daydreams about these books that she's reading you're totally transported and you're totally in her mind and she's the heroine in this scene in whatever book she's currently reading and it's like hilarious it's really <laughs> funny yeah it's really funny i wish right now i could remember at least the year. I want to say it's from the 90s. Okay. So uh, yeah, I don't think I've seen any adaptations of that one. I think you uh, would I think you might like that one just because of those kind of dream sequences that she has. Yeah, okay. They're very they're like really witty and really clever. Hmm. I'll have to check that out definitely. Yeah. I I, I love the it's going to I'll have to ask it uh too, but I, I like adaptations of some of that that work. It, it's in some books, it's helped me understand parts of the book I didn't understand reading. Oh, okay. And then seeing it visualized, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. Right. Um, assuming they're making a faithful adaptation, I guess. But <laughs> um, with, with that in mind, do you have a favorite Jane Eyre adaptation? My favorite miniseries is the Masterpiece Theater one with Ruth Wilson. Okay. Okay, and my favorite film adaptation is the one, um, I know I'm going to butcher her name, with Mia mm. Wasiko, I'm sorry, with Mia. Mia, yeah. With Mia and I'm so bad, the guy that plays Magneto. Mag that's what I was thinking too, yeah, yeah Magneto I'm and... So I'm so sorry, I know fans <laughs> are probably thinking, how can she have written Bronte <laughs> poem? She doesn't know the names of anybody, <laughs> she's seen now sorry guys well hey i i <laughs> it's I, like today is like a slow day my brain's not working that well today that's, so that's but, um, fine that's yeah, fine that plays magneto so in case you can't tell i do read a lot of different kinds of things because yeah i read comic books too oh well awesome yeah <laughs> i read all sorts of things for my next book i'm working on um superhero poems hmm. and poems about navigating life with uh chronic daily headaches and migraines Mm -hmm. And sometimes both of them um, intersect. So one of the things that I actually didn't know and that I found uh, really moved me a lot is that in Charlotte Bronte's letters, she talks about very bad headaches that she gets, mm -hmm. some of them lasting, you know, six days, seven days. And I was like, wow, I didn't know that. Now, whether because partially it was because of a nervous disposition or whether the weather we know now that shifts in the barometric pressure can cause uh, migraines or bad headaches i live in florida so whenever there's the menace of a hurricane i just try to get very quickly to my neurologist and get nerve blocks mm -hmm. and if that's not possible i just want to get out of florida because i know it's going to be a really rough rough time when that happens for you know people who get headaches i don't know if that's the same for earthquakes but i'm wondering if that happens uh, to people as well like do they get a migraine before an earthquake happens i've always wanted to ask that but anyways in her letters i read about it and i think she had different things against her in terms of that she you know 
was dealing with uh, different things, but I think just the way that the weather especially was in the area where she lives, a lot of the times when she's writing about that she has this horrible headache, the winds, the gales are buffeting the home mm. in, in, in that area. And I thought, oh, my God, to go through bad headaches like that, Back then, with um, well, some of the stuff that they took for medication was super hardcore. But we know they didn't really have any medications back then. You know that, like now, mm -hmm. and even now, even now, treating chronic daily headaches and migraines is challenging for people. But in the Jane and Bertha, in me, in the second half, I have a sonnet cycle that is about. It, that is about that, about dealing with chronic daily headaches and migraines, and it, it's about my personal experiences with that. It's about Charlotte's experiences with that. Uh, the poem is called The Literature of Prescription, and that title is borrowed from, from an exhibit that is actually about another Charlotte, about the author and activist Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who wrote the book The Yellow wallpaper have you read yeah. that yeah yes i i just read that uh, a couple months ago uh, okay yeah. so they assigned the yellow wallpaper the first time i read it i think was in high school and then the second time i read it was in an in an introduction to women's studies uh course mm -hmm. and, um, so it, it it's about uh it mentions charlotte perkins you know taking the the rest cure that her doctor at the time had uh, prescribed for her, which is similar to the the protagonist in the uh, the wallpaper. What they really give her is the rest cure, mm -hmm. you know, because Charlotte uh, Perkins Gilman wrote that story as a cautionary tale. So, anyways, in the letters of Charlotte, it really strikes me her suffering when she has the migraines, since I'm a sufferer myself. Um, so I wrote about myself and both Charlottes in that sonnet cycle that's in the second half of, of the book. Mm -hmm. it's, they're sort of like modern sonnets, which are kind of fun to write. I also have another sonnet cycle that is called Jane Eyre, Classic Cover Girl. And each sonnet is about a different Jane Eyre book cover. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. at one point, fans had a contest online, and like they made like, like spoof covers, right? So mm -hmm. some of them are of the spoof covers and others are just like if you go to Google and you type Jane Eyre and you hit images, like you you see all these covers and some of those older covers are like really interesting <laughs> the way that they're like illustrated. Yeah. Yeah. That's that sounds great. Um no I I, I as I told you I, I've been reading your book uh and I'm about halfway through. I, I don't think I've gotten to those two yet. But I, I've really been enjoying uh, this collection you've put together uh, or that you, you wrote. Just uh, kind of changing gears here, let's talk about your book a little bit. Um, what, what I mean, I know Jane Eyre kind of inspired that, but can you walk us through how, how this book came together for you? Okay, well, it, at some point, like I said, in a creative writing class, I wrote, uh, I think it was a sonnet or a short poem mm -hmm. related to Jane Eyre. And then at another point, I wrote a second one. And then when I was in graduate school, then I was writing different types of poems in graduate school. But at one point, uh, but now and then, some of the poems here and there would be Jane poems. It's like when I got sick of writing or I couldn't deal with the other types of poems, then I would always go back to the Jane poems, right? Mm -hmm. So I felt it was a universe that I knew very well. In the same way, if any of your viewers have ever watched a soap opera, been devoted to watching a soap opera, you get to know the characters and their backstories. You get to know them and the settings and everything. You get to know it very well. So I felt very comfortable. So I kept working on the poems uh, not that long after. I, I picked some scenes from – there are some scenes that – from Jane Eyre that are recreated in some of the poems in the book. Um, like there's a triptych, a three-part poem, and one of the one of the poems recreates uh, Jane being locked in the red room, mm -hmm. right? Another like when she's told to stand on that stool. Another that scene uh, with her bratty cousin 
uh, John Reed when he like launches the book at her. Mm -hmm. So some of those scenes I've rewritten them as as prose poems and tried to put a little bit of uh, my spin on them because they were just very memorable moments for me and I'm sure for many people who have read uh, Jane Eyre. Uh, then there are other poems. Uh, there are poems where where uh, Edward gets slammed. There are poems where, hey, like there's a poem called uh, uh, Jane. Uh, there's a poem that's all about why why Edward Rochester and Jane is telling us this is why, and it's a poem about something about a good quality that he has. Mm -hmm. um, there is a poem in there about Helen. Helen is a very influential character. But I think for myself, when I was in graduate school, I was sort of going through a crisis because that's around the time that my chronic daily headaches uh, and migraines kicked in. So I felt at, at certain times, like the first time I had a migraine uh, was in Ireland in a study abroad trip I was on. And I thought I was going crazy. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. All I knew is that I was in a room. It was like a tea room. And I could hear every single fork clinking against every single plate. It just like the sound was so amplified that I had, I got up and I, I walked out. Mm -hmm. And then I just started crying because the there was such a sensory overload. And I didn't know what that was. I thought, oh, my God, I'm going crazy. So, I mean, that's not a politically correct term. You're but right. that's how I felt. That's right. how I felt. So when that happened, guess who I started th relating to? Bertha. Bertha, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I know some people are like, whoa, we got the Jane part, but why the Bertha part? So the book is called uh, The Jane and Bertha in Me. You know, there's also a poem in there called Letter to Bertha that's about, you know, if I could, I would save her. This is what I would do, and this is how I would try to save. I would try to save her. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so these poems are, you would call them uh, prose poems? Is, is that the right term? No. There's some prose poems in there, and the, mm -hmm. most, of the, most of the poems are in free verse, uh, there are two sonnet cycles, but they're what's referred to as non-sonnets. They're 14 lines each, mm -hmm. but they're not written in iambic pentameter, but they stay true to the essence of what a sonnet is. Former poet laureate Rita Dove, um, she wrote a poetry book called Mother Love, and that book in influenced me greatly. Mm -hmm. And the whole book is full of sonnets about the relationship between Persephone and Demeter mm -hmm. in, in mythology. So that tale is told through sonnets in that book. And the word sonnet means, I, f I forget, like little room. Or it, it has like there's a term for what the word sonnet means. I know I'm a bad poet. It's like <laughs> little, it's like a... A, like a small room it's something like that of a room a sonnet focuses in and targets very much on a concentrated image or on something very specific much in the same way a photograph does so that's sort of what the the sonnets try to to um what they try to do they try to fo focus mm -hmm. on specific things so the sonnets that are describing or writing about the jane different jane Eyre book covers uh, that could also be referred to as ekphrastic poetry ekphrastic poetry like if you go to a museum and you see a painting and you write a poem based on the painting right, right. Mm -hmm. so i would consider those because it's artwork their book covers, I would consider those also to be ekphrastic poems. There's a lot of catalog or list poems. Sure. What's called catalog or list poems as well. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I'm i not that well versed in poetry. It's kind of a new field for me. So okay. um, th this is all new information, uh, which I, it's fascinating. In your book, I, I love the imagery, but, you know, about the only 
education and poem I, I was given was like in grade school where, okay, it has to rhyme. It has to make sense, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so I, I I'm still trying to folk view this, you know, through that lens. And I'm like, no, this isn't working. <laughs> so, but my poem, but you're like, Oh, her poems don't rhyme. Right. Right. That's it. But they're so beautiful. Uh, and just the way they're written. Yeah. But I, I use other toolbox in the poets. I use other tools in the poets toolbox, like, um, alliteration, mm-hmm anaphora which is like repetition so there's different poetic elements to be honest i mean uh i'm not you know putting down you know uh more formal poems or anything but the majority of contemporary poets tend to write more in free verse Mm -hmm. a contemporary poem that rhymes in my opinion it does it so well but it does it in a subtle way where you don't even realize they're doing it I know that sounds strange, but it's not moon, June, spoon. It's not those kinds. It's not those kinds of rhymes that hit you over the head like that. It has yeah. to be like a little bit more subtle. Now, sometimes in poems, I, uh, poets use what's called slant rhyme, it, which it's not a true rhyme. It's not like moon, June, spoon. Uh, maybe it's like ren and learn. Like there's a similar. There's a little bit of a similar sound, but it's not the same, if that right. makes any sense. Yeah. But yeah. I just tried to, but I do try to use different um, tools in the poet's uh, toolbox. And it's also fun to take older forms and adapt them and put your spin on it, on them, which is what I tried to do with um, with the sonnets. And, and this is why I'm, I'm glad you reached out uh, you know, in the last episode. Uh, I had a poet on, she, she's written, a, just published a book of haikus, which I oh, really liked great. because yeah. they're, they're short and small and just draw you in, leaving you wanting more. Yeah, uh, and, great. and uh, so, and this is something completely different than that, but still the imagery is there. The, the pulling me in is there, you know, that. Uh, Did you feel like you were understanding them? Yeah. 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 Um, sometimes I think sometimes people get a little scared of poetry if they read because they might feel like they read it, but they didn't understand it. Right. Sometimes right. that happens to me, too, that I have to read a poem two or three times to get the full impact. And I think that when you read poetry, it's not the same as reading a novel or another type of book. Like, it's okay. Like, don't read it in a whole sitting. You have to kind of savor it like a really good dessert that you want it to last, even though at some point it's going to end, but you want it to last. So when I read a, a, a new book of poetry that's out by somebody, I mean, it could take me a week or more mm-hmm. to, really, to really, you know, digest it. I'll read it. And then at some point I'll gradually reread it. Uh, yeah. That's, that's something I am learning to do is I can't read it like a novel or, or a book and just sit here and read it. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, and I think, what I wasn't appreciating is it, it's challenging you to slow down too a little bit and yeah. just in thinking and in your time. And it's, it's a great, I've started reading some at night as I'm getting ready for bed, you know, going to bed. I do that too. I do that. <laughs> it's a really nice way to just get your brain to calm down and yeah. You have to like focus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to uh, have you read one of your poems if you'd, if you like uh, to, to go ahead and read that, just the, the opening poem of your collection uh, called Reading Jane Eyre. Uh, sure. and if, if you had that and uh, wanted to go ahead and read that for us. You know, sometimes one poem would spark an, another poem because there's like a, there's a poem in the book called Reading Jane Slayer. And that's one of those mashup books that were popular a couple of years ago. So sometimes in the process of writing the poems, Sometimes one poem begets another, Mm -hmm. which is an interesting kind of thing. Okay, so this is the title poem of the book. Reading Jane Eyre. I covered it with clear contact paper, wrote my name in caps across the foredge in black marker. The bloated book rested on my desk like a rainbow trout. Mrs. Lloyd poised on the stool, her bangs and bob, stiff like a man in a toupee, face primed with a thick coat of concealer. She hinted a secret at the heart of the text. 
I spotted it in her eyes whenever she laughed, flung her arms like tentacles, crossed her legs, private insanity hidden inside her wisteria wool skirt, tucked out of sight like Thornfield's third floor tenant. Linda Blair's precursor, the supposed basket case languishing in bed. I read in bed. On the bamboo love seat, beneath the shade of my father's banana trees, I scarfed the pages like pork rinds, yuca chips, crackers slathered with guava jelly. I binged constantly, sunk my canines into text while blurs, boys and girls, wailed in the background like Bertha on speed. I carried it for weeks inside the outer pocket of my East Pack like Tic Tacs, a compact I'd flip open during lunch between classes before soccer practice, Bantam paperback lodged between Agnes Gray and Weathering Heights at Adolph's bookstore, its spine red-orange like papaya pulp. I plucked it from the shelf and stared at the cover, the forlorn wedding dress yearning for Jane's scapula, her small breasts, the warmth of her hips when she walks across the bedroom and steps into wedding slippers, then into absence, the foot's descent consuming as quicksand, the subtle curve of her arch sheathed by glass. Mm. Thank you. I love this because it's so visual. I, I mean, I can imagine this book now in, in your backpack. I can picture the way it looks. It's it's incredible. It, and maybe we can, many of us have had that one book that we've just carried with us everywhere and we're reading it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It happened to me too with great expectations. Mm. That, that was in my backpack a long time. <laughs> That's another one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I like your line there uh, that says that she was uh, Linda Blair's precursor, you know, that you have to know, some. okay, who's she talking about? What's going on there? And it just all fills in the picture about who, um, uh, oh, no, now I'm blanking on names. Bertha. Bertha. <laughs> but Bertha, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. No, it, yeah, it's my afternoon nap time, so no. Yeah, I, I, I transmitted my brain fog. So. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, you get almost, just a couple of words, and you instantly get this view of who Bertha is and the whole the whole uh, uh, picture of her. Uh, so yeah, that's and that's the first poem in the book, and and each one just is so wonderfully written and pulls you in. And gives us some picture into your life, into your love for this book. Um, another one I really liked was the third one. They're called uh, The Guidance Counselor Interrogates Jane. <laughs> and I, I really like that one. <laughs> what do you like about that one? Um, I, again, I think there's some humor there. The, uh, the, the picture, like just right off the bat when you said, um, she of the nervous tick, the Larry King lookalike with pleated pants hiked to the neck sits at her desk, arms folded, staring disinterestedly at your file, the same way uh, the board do at tabloids under the oppressive lights of Walmart. Uh, it, it, I, that one I mean, was a bit snarky. Yeah, I yeah. Snarky I, <laughs> I, 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 lo I love the snark in it because we, I, I'm the, the school our kids are currently going to, they have some wonderful guidance counselors there and it's wonderful teachers but sometimes there's one bad apple yep yep right? uh and it's kind of like what happens when you are assigned to have that bad apple right guidance counselor that's right. not yeah. right well and and maybe we all have that person in our life too that wants to just stifle our creativity or or stifle our our hope mm -hmm. you know our, our our dreams say someday i want to do this and they're like well that's not realistic for you so you should consider this instead. You know, this is the safe choice. And you're thinking, I don't want the safe choice. I want to, I want to jump in and, and, and dream and, and chase that dream. Yeah. yeah. Also, sometimes the way we view things when we're younger can be different than we're older as well. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. It, it's having kids, especially as they're, 
getting to be teenagers and, you know, considering the big life choices, um, part of me wants to make sure that they pursue a path that will, you know, keep them alive and, and keep them provided for and all that. But uh, too, I, I want to make sure they have that passion to follow a dream, even if it's a little bit of a risk, you know? Um, sure. Yeah. It, it's that hard line to walk, but, but yeah, yeah. that, but that poem, I, I really love the, the little bit of snark <laughs> in there because I'm like, there, yeah, I know people. Poem. There's but, another poem in there called Governess to Go. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even think that was a Jane Eyre poem when I wrote it because it, it's about my experiences as, as a private tutor making house calls and trying to help different kids. And each one has their own unique personality. And I titled it Governess to Go. And then I did end up putting it in this book because we know the Bronte sisters, at least two of them were governesses, right? Mm -hmm. But um, uh, a friend of mine said, oh, did you write this? Did you title it that? And did you write this because, you know, Jane Eyre and Charlotte Bronte were governesses? And that's not initially wasn't the intention at all. Mm -hmm. And then I was like whoa, maybe on a subconscious level, but I wasn't aware of it. <laughs> but then I thought, oh, you know what? This book might fit into the collection, might fit into the, the collection. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not this book, this poem. This poem, right, It's right. kind of weird. Sometimes things like that creep up on you and you don't really realize it at the time. Yeah, hey, I've been influenced by them and I didn't even see it, yeah. Boy, we're going to end up talking all afternoon here. <laughs> Uh, a couple more questions here before we uh, uh, wrap up, but uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, why do you think Charlotte Bronte matters today or, or Jane Eyre matters today? Uh, is, is that a book that matters? I think so very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the character of Jane Eyre, I think she's a very strong character. Mm, uh, there's, you know, that section in when Jane is in Thornfield where she talks about the importance of women having like a role in life, having something to do, that you're bursting with ideas and Charlotte is sort of pacing back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I like that, that Jane Eyre is a character that sticks to her guns. Like, it could have been easy for her to just shack up with Rochester and just, you know, and and uh, sort of betray her own personal code, right? Mm-hmm. But she doesn't do that. Like, for a while, she takes a much harder path. She doesn't do that. And I think that that just says a lot about who who she is. I admire her gutsiness as a kid, as a kid like, just in, like, uh... When she tells uh, Aunt Reed off and just in certain things, I admire her, her gutsiness as a child. I admire the way that she treats Adele, Mm -hmm. right? She treats Adele very well because she knows what it's like to be an orphan and to have that yearning inside uh, to be loved. So I think there's different aspects of the novel that are, that are appealing, uh, in my opinion, mainly because of the character of Jane, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, you, in terms of Charlotte's Bronte, you asked, like, why is her life still relevant? Sort of, I think it's mm-hmm. very relevant and uh, probably a great idea to read a biography of her if someone's read one of her books, because especially if you're a writer, because she overcame a lot of obstacles. Like, we know that uh, one of her books, I don't remember, was it The Professor? Uh, she would send the book out, and then she would leave the same wrapper on it and just cross out the address of the publisher before oh. where she had sent it to, mm-hmm. and then she would write the next one on the wrapper, and it would go back in the mail, and that's what it's like to be a contemporary writer. Like, you write a poem or you write a short story, and maybe... You send it to a literary journal and it gets rejected, right? Mm -hmm. What happens? You have to send it out again, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, My book had a bunch of rejections before it was accepted. But ultimately, each rejection sort of forced me to keep tinkering and to keep tweaking the book and to improve it and to make it better. 
but Charlotte Bronte went through all those things. Uh, you can see how she reacted when critics uh, kind of were nice or not so nice about her book. Um, right. So I just think there's a lot of things. And I think she's inspirational, too, because she went through so much. And she did go through periods of dryness as well in terms of her writing. So I think that, yeah, I think that is very relevant, especially if you're a woman, I think. Right. Yeah. It, it. You don't have to be. Well. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I. I. I too appreciate just that sticking to her character as much as she wanted to marry Rochester. I'm not going to do it this way. And for a woman in her time period, you, you know, they were considered old maids at a very young age if they weren't married. She was facing homelessness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, a big deal. She slept outside on the moors or whatever, like one night mm -hmm. when I first read that, I was like, oh, my God, this is like the bottom of the. And then she like was begging. She became was begging for a little bit because she mm -hmm. was hungry. It was like would have been a lot easier to just stay at Thornfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she she did the right thing, even though that was probably the hardest thing to do. She stressed she stayed true to her moral code during mm -hmm. yeah tough time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I like to end these conversations with the, the three questions I like to ask my guests. Uh, we, we may have already answered number question one, but we'll, we'll see if, it, yeah. <laughs> if anything, anything else there to add. Uh, if you have a favorite book or author, I, I guess it's safe to say it's Charlotte Bronte and Jane Eyre, huh? Yeah. 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 But my favorite book of literary criticism is The Mad Woman in the Attic by Gilbert and Gubar, mm -hmm. written in the 70s. It's a classic. And um, even though time has passed, I still think it's very relevant. Uh, and there are essays in there uh, about about the Brontes and about different female writers, about Emily Dickinson and other writers as well. Um, what's your other question? Um, the other one is, uh, what was an early experience uh, where you learned that language uh, or a story had power. Okay, this doesn't have to do with um, reading, though. Okay, but that's, it's, yeah. It's, it, but I think it answers the question. When I was in high school, the whole debacle was uh, ongoing between Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which was a case where uh, she was accusing him of uh, sexual harassment and the Senate Judicial hearings were going on uh, every day in high school, uh, there was something called TV One, where for 10 minutes you would watch the news on TV One. And it was news that was geared or garnered toward teenagers. And I remember at one point, usually most of us had kind of tuned it out and like took a nap or whatever. But, yeah. you know, or, or only paid attention. There was like a Gillette commercial with hunky guys. That's sometimes <laughs> the only time the girls paid yeah. attention to like TV one, which is funny. But anyway, so uh, so what happened is they kept repeating the phrase sexual harassment, sexual harassment. And then sometimes like I, Bush was pronouncing it. Uh, President Bush was pronouncing harassment. Mm -hmm. And I think I I I, I, w I thought how are they going to get to any accord if they don't even know how to pronounce this? <laughs> like, that's not even the case because we know that people, depending on where you live, there are different inflections and everything. But I remember the that that thought crossing my mind, and I remember thinking that I believed her. I still do believe her. Um, and then when I was in two different classes. In one class, in my geometry class, later on, I had a boy who said something that was very sexually explicit to me. Mm -hmm. I was the type of person that if you say something to me once, I'll let it go. But the second time, no, because I, I needed to nip it in the bud type of thing. He said something very sexually explicit, and right away, I raised my hand, and I told the teacher. And I said, so-and-so just sexually harassed me. Mm-hmm. That phrase, sexual harassment, sort of empowered me because I was able to kind of out him in class for what he did without having to say the words that he said that were degrading. Mm -hmm. 
right? And he never bothered me again. Then there was another guy that was a friend of his, and I don't remember what he said, but it was a similar thing. First time, I'll let it go. Second time, okay, I got to stop it. I raised my arm, and the teacher, and I said, so-and-so just sexually harassed me. And then the teacher said, oh, no, so-and-so wouldn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I said, he did? I said, oh, yes, he did, and what are you going to do about it? This was in front of the whole class. Wow. So this was my computer teacher. And um, there had been a girl at my school that a boy had kept bothering her a couple of years back, and she mm -hmm. ended up leaving the school. Now, I don't know if it was sexual harassment, but I know it was harassment. And I never wanted something to escalate to that level, ever. And don't get me wrong, I loved high school. I had a great high school experience. These are just two incidents that happened. So basically, I said, you can ask the girl next to me. She heard it, right? So mm -hmm. this teacher, if you would be late to class, she would make you do either push-ups or jumping jacks. So she had him. He tried to do a push-up. <laughs> and this guy could barely do one. <laughs> so then he ended up doing like jumping jacks and, and uh, the whole class just kind of laughed at him. So never bothered me again either. So that phrase sexual harassment freed me, freed, really freed me to, it, I, didn't, I don't know if before that, if I knew that that phrase existed or not, but that phrase Freed me to say what, what what was done to me without having to use the degrading the degrading words the sexually explicit words and it turned out really well so I would say it was related to Anita Hill mm -hmm. and uh, the power was in the phrase sexual harassment. I mean there there and there are stories or words or phrases like that when when you finally have words to put to your experience that that can be like you said very freeing that not only do i understand now what i just went through i get i'm able to communicate that in a way that other people can understand uh you know that's one of the tragedies of uh, you know crimes against children especially they often don't understand what happened or what what's going on or how to verbalize that yeah yeah there's a really great uh, poetry anthology that came out a year ago. I have a poem in it, um, but there's a lot of people who wrote poems in that anthology, male, men, women, and it's called Grabbed. Mm -hmm. And it's about, and um, I think Anita Hill wrote the, um, the afterword in the book. Mm -hmm. And it's about people, whatever your experience of being grabbed is. Maybe it was a physical type of thing or assault, or maybe it was like a psychological uh, type of thing. Uh, the poem in there, it's not even about me. It's a poem about a girl that they gave her an inappropriate gift in class one day. Uh, so that's what it's about. But uh, that, that whole book is sort of... Uh, the purpose is, you know, that you write and maybe like if you haven't come to terms with certain things that have happened to you, maybe you can kind of heal by getting it out on paper. And maybe if other people read that book, then maybe you can see, hey, I'm not alone. Yeah. You know, when yeah. this X or Z happens, you know, this was happening to other people, too. Yeah. Yeah. That ho hopefully profoundly healing to, to people. So. Yeah. So that anthology poetry, no, it's uh, it's mainly poetry. Yeah, it's called Grabbed. Grabbed. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look it up and uh, put a link in the show notes if it's if I can find it uh, somewhere for sale. So, yeah. Um, okay. One one final question here. Um, so, what advice do you have for any aspiring writers or any aspiring poets? Okay. Well, I would. Poetry doesn't really, you know, make you a lot of money. <laughs> but it pays in other ways. I met my husband at a poetry at a reading where I read a poem. So sometimes poetry, you know, um, pays in other ways. But mm -hmm. I would say just to write about what's important to you, or about what you like, or what's important to you. The topic doesn't matter. It could be anything. You could write a poem about playing Pac-Man when you were like a kid. It doesn't matter. Uh, that doesn't matter. And I would say do what Charlotte Bronte did, that once her work was finished, that she kept sending it out and she kept sending it out. And a lot of the time, persistence is is really key. Um, you don't have to get, you can, but you really don't have to get a, a graduate degree to write poetry. Anybody can write poetry. You can just 
grab a notebook and and uh, start doing it. Um, I think we're living in a really interesting time now, like I said, with all these online Zoom sessions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and there's many places uh, offering like mini workshops online now on Zoom. Some are free, some aren't. Um, but that might be an option for for some people. Like, hey, maybe I should take I, let me take a course online or something with someone and let me take a workshop. Like they'll give you like maybe prompts, poetry prompts. Mm -hmm. And then like you write your, your poem and then you get together next week and, and everybody tells you uh, what you can do to improve your poem. Right. Although mm -hmm. the ultimate judge is really you, right. you yourself. I would, but the most important thing for any writer, I don't think it matters what genre is really persistence, which is hard to do to separate ourselves from the everyday and concentrate sometimes on our work with like, you know, other things going on or your day job or whatever might be, you know, happening. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, uh, it's also, uh, unless you're writing collaborative poetry, some people do that, but, um, that's a whole other animal in a way, but it's a very, writing is a very solitary, uh, venture i guess mm -hmm. so it's not easy so it is important also to find community community mm -hmm. that's important too for people who have been to grad school and were used to having this built-in audience that would give you feedback and all of a sudden you don't have that so like i have a group of girlfriends that were all poets and we meet once a week and sometimes we don't even talk about writing we'll talk about whatever drama yeah. that's going on in the literary world or in our lives or what we're, we're reading other times someone will say hey I wrote this poem but I have I'm having trouble can you guys help me out so kind of having community is important attending um, there are some live events that are starting again so like when you feel comfortable uh, with the world situation right now attending like most poetry events are free right to attend mm -hmm. like attending poetry events sometimes if you become a regular attending certain events like you get to meet people and you start forming a community and i think that sense yeah. of community is important too yeah yeah i can d definitely agree with that uh i have a, a podcast community that we're a part of and uh and it's not it, it's refreshing because a lot of us cover the the same general subject but we're promoting each other rather than trying to outdo each other. And that's how it should be. Yeah. That's how it should be. You know, sometimes like somebody might pick a bit, win a big award. It could be one of your best friends or something, right? It could right. be, or it could be somebody you don't like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And we're all human. We're all thinking, I wish it were me, but you know, you know, if you, if you got some good insides there in you, you're going to be like, that's awesome. And you're going to congratulate the person. And uh, my group does that a lot. We call ourselves the uh, Miami Poetas Collective. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we lift each other up a lot. Like, uh, we try to be really supportive. It's not about us doing x y or z like that's kind of exhausting after a while isn't it yeah like yeah. trying to always be like number one the competition i tell students i tutor that the competition shouldn't be so much with others it should be really, really be with yourself mm -hmm. i know that might sound kind of corny but that's what I, what I tell them and i think that that's how it is with that group of friends that we're always encouraging each other and we're each other's cheerleaders and i think that that's how it should be yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's so such a positive experience. I mean, it makes the whole thing uh, more enjoyable, you know, when you yeah, know you've got a, a lot of ugliness in the world. Oh, yeah. We, we don't need to add to that. Right. Right. It, to bring in beautiful things like poetry, more poetry and things like that into the world. Right. And I'm, I'm going to steal that line now. <laughs> we need to bring in <laughs> beautiful things. Yes. Exactly. Well, uh, Rita, thank you so much for uh, joining with me today. Uh, it's It's been a blast talking with you. I really appreciate you giving me the time to do that. Thanks. I had a really nice time chatting with you about all things uh, Bronte. So thanks for having me. Definitely. And uh, if you folks want to get her book, uh, the, the Jane and Bertha in Me, 
you can go to uh, comeonhome.org backslash Rita Martinez. Hopefully I got that all right. Uh, or and Google. Or, or, yep, or Google her, her name and she'll come up. Yeah. Rita Maria Martinez. Rita Maria Martinez. You can uh, Google that. And her uh, signed copies of her book are available on her website. So you can go there. And if you live outside of the United States, you can order through Amazon, it uh, looks like. Uh, but uh, here in the States, if you want to get that through her website, that helps her out tremendously. So um, I'd encourage you to do that. It's just a, a beautiful collection uh, of stories. And we're looking forward to w- what you have in the future, uh, get, oh, getting more, more poetry from you. So thanks. You bet. And well, thanks again for coming on and uh, helping me figure out a little bit about uh, Jane Eyre and, and poetry. So <laughs> appreciate that. All right. You take care. Thanks again, Rita, for reaching out to me to come on the uh, podcast. I greatly appreciate it and your insight into the Brontes. So let me encourage you, if you have not yet read Jane Eyre, to put that on your TBR. I'm not going to guarantee that it's going to be one of your next great reads, but it was for me, and I really enjoyed that book. A couple things I want you to, uh, to check out here before I go. Like I said, I don't have a story for us this week, but I am recording one for the YouTube channel as a part of the Victober challenge is to read a book or story aloud and or listen to a story being read aloud. So to fulfill that challenge, I'm going to be reading at least one, maybe a couple of stories over on my YouTube channel. And you can find that by look searching for Bookshelf Odyssey Podcast on uh, YouTube and it should come up. So I'll have some fun Victorian writer related videos going up over there, especially this month. Starting next week, we're going to begin to get into the Halloween season. I've got uh, a story I'm planning to read next week, uh, The Rocking Chair by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And then uh, the following week, I'll have an interview with some folks who are putting on a new uh, radio drama this year. And I think you'll enjoy that, that drama. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, that's all I'll say about it for now. But it's a, uh, uh, other than to say, it sounds like it's going to be a, in the vein of a classic locked room mystery dinner radio theater kind of, kind of deal. So uh, you'll want to stick around for that. And then as we get closer to Halloween, I'll have one or two episodes dropping right around that time. One will be another story by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, as well as an interview with the author Juno Jacob. And we're going to be talking about his new book about Halloween. I think we're going to take some time to talk about our favorite writer, Ray Bradbury, as well. We can't go through October without talking about Bradbury, for sure. So uh, a lot of fun things coming up in the next couple of weeks. I would love for you to make sure to tune in and take a listen to those. And if you'd be so kind to uh, subscribe or to to give us a good rating on uh, iTunes or wherever you listen to this, that you're able to do that, uh, that really helps out the podcast and for people to be able to find it. And until we meet again, never stop exploring your bookshelf. Take care.